time last year. It's amazing. It's great. Yeah, we still got a few more people coming in, and then I'll just make sure. Let me make sure my share screen is off. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Simone Roche and I'm the founder of Northern Power Women. I'm delighted to invite you here this afternoon to join our live webinar with just the, quite frankly, phenomenal Stacey Copeland, all-round legend and paved the way. Welcome, Stacey. We are thrilled to have you here the, uh, this afternoon. How are you? Good. Thanks very much for having me and thanks everyone for joining. Really appreciate it. And you know what we want uh, this afternoon is we've been running these at uh, two o'clock on a Tuesday sessions and it's all about getting up close and personal with real role models like yourself. So people want to hear about you and then we're going to open up to a chat if that's okay with you. So I'm, I'm not going to intro you because I know you've got this all in your former words, but you are, you know, ex-England player, Commonwealth champion and all role, all round, just wonderful role model for all humans so welcome Stacey and tell us about you tell us about your story it's been easy hasn't it <laughs> so um yeah my, obviously my uh, background is in, in sport and um I started out in boxing and football those are my two great loves as a kid um in boxing um it was really difficult to get started because it was illegal for, for women when I was a kid. So my dad was a boxer, my granddad ran our boxing gym and I just loved it from the minute that I went in the gym, I just loved everything about it. Um, and when I got to about the age of 11, I'd been doing everything that my little lad mates did in the gym, all the training, the sparring, going to the shows. I just loved everything about the sport. And um, we went to my granddad uh, and said, right, you know, we're ready to box, ready to box. And he just looked at me and he said, y you can't box. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, oh, it's, it's illegal. It's against the law for girls. And I just couldn't believe it. But obviously it was, it was against the law for girls back then. And I was just absolutely gutted that I wouldn't get to do the sport that I loved. Um, with football, it was slightly different in the, um, Tim, can you just empty the dishwasher later, darling? <laughs> he's putting me off. <laughs> I think he's doing his bit for equality, but it's not the right time. Do you know what I mean? All day he starts doing it at two o'clock. Oh, we'll need our Northern Power men in the kitchen, Stacey. You know I mean, I know, but not right now when you're doing a webinar. Bloody hell. Anyway, well done, darling. <laughs> I'm a little hero. So, um, yeah, so uh, in terms of football, the ban on women's football was lifted in this country in 1971. We were banned for 50 years. Um, but because the FA, the Football Association, didn't recognise girls and women's football till 93, in the 80s, when I was a little girl at school, there were no opportunities really for girls in football. There was no league structure, no teams, but they also had a rule that you couldn't play with the boys. But it was all I wanted to do. And, and the playground at playtime and lunchtime, um, I did have lots of girls who were, who were, you know, my mates, but they just weren't doing stuff I was into. They tended to be doing that thing with elastic bands, um, hopscotch, having weddings, just wasn't my thing, still isn't. And... Um, I wanted to play football. So I went along to first team training and we had our first game. I was about seven or eight years old and it was just thrilling, that feeling of being on the pitch, part of my first football game with my team. And the whistle went, the game started. And then during the game, a parent and a coach realised that I was a girl and shouted across the pitch, you know, that I, I shouldn't be on the pitch, I'd have to leave. And I had to walk across the pitch. And obviously I didn't have the words to articulate what that felt like at the time, but now... I know, you know, I felt ashamed. I felt like there was something wrong with me. Um, somehow it didn't stop me, though. Um, instead, I went home and I insisted that my mum cut my hair short so I could pretend to be a boy and play on the team. But this led to problems with kids saying, why do you want to be a boy? Well, I never wanted to be a boy. I just wanted to play football, and that was the only way. Um, but that short haircut did help. My mum was a crap hairdresser, as it happens, but it, it did the trick. And um, I was able to you know, box to a certain point in the gym, although I couldn't compete and play football. And that, that was how it started in me for football and boxing. So very, very early on, I was, I was made acutely aware that my gender was going to be um, quite a, a serious barrier beyond just perceptions 
there were actual laws in place to prevent me from doing the things that I loved. And what sort of then inspired you on, other than your short haircut and uh, your, your gra I mean, your grands are telling you, sorry, sorry, love, you can't play. I mean, you must have just thought, well, what, what, what on earth? This is, but I want to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, you know, and I've had uh, two great role models in my granddad and my dad. I mean, they say these things are generational, but my granddad's, you know, well in his 80s now and, and has always had the attitude that, that, you know, he had two daughters, he's got three granddaughters and two grandsons, and now he's got two great granddaughters. So he's very dominated by women, the lucky thing. And um, he has always had the attitude that, you know, whatever you want to do, whatever you're good at, whatever you love, just because you're a girl, you know, you should be able to do it. And he took me you know, to New York with the boxing club when I was 10 years old. I mean, what an experience that was. And we went into Gleason's gym and I was on the bag. And one of the coaches came over and was like, hey, girls can't box in here, you can't box, da, 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 whatever. And my granddad was like, no, she will be boxing. Like, she's part of the club. She's, part, she's a boxer. And, you know, to stand up for me like that against another man in such a, you know, male environment was um, a real... A real lesson, I think, and, and um, you know, he, he was a pioneer in, in his own way, I guess. So, and my dad always coached me and, you know, encouraged me in, in boxing because I loved it. So, um, I had those examples. So, I, I think that obviously helped that I had family support. But as to quite why I didn't give up and I kept going, I don't know. I don't know if that's just something that's in you. And the sad thing is that more and more now I hear from parents or, you know, who've got children or people who've got older and you know are looking back on their experiences and they gave up you know whether that might be parents who've got you know i've heard several times parents say that the son absolutely loves ballet or a certain type of dance but they got really picked on laughed at and they've given up and i just think my god if you took away from me sport and what it's done for my life the places i've been who i've become what i've been able to do and even more importantly than what it's done for me how i've been able to use that for good for others that massive ripple effect, all of that would be taken away if I'd have given up because of that stigma. And the kids are still giving up stuff now because of the stigma they face because of gender. And I just, that's what paved the way is about, that gender should never be a barrier to human potential. We need to do better to take away this stigma so that people can just fulfil the potential and whatever they love. And um, well, thank God you didn't give up. Say, so, so you're, you're back in the, going into your football, your mum's cut your hair. Um, she, she must be doing a Rory trade in lockdown. Um, but, so then what, what was your football journey? Because you, you played for your country, you know, it's amazing. I did. So what, what happened was around about the age of, like it was 11 when I asked if I could box and granddad said, you know, there's no opportunities. So I was a really, really driven kid. I was ready to compete in sport. So doing it for fun, I kind of started to, I wanted to compete. Um, and because that was the fun bit for me. And because I couldn't compete in boxing, I very much then started to go towards football. And of course, by then, uh, the FA was starting to get involved with women's football. So they're creating leagues and teams and it was a structure and a pathway to, to achieve what you wanted. So I went into football. It also coincided with me watching Karate Kid and trying to do the crane on the banister at the top of the stairs, uh, which resulted in me reaching the bottom of the stairs very quickly and I broke my shoulder. Um, so that was me out of boxing for quite a while. So it just, it was like that, you know, a few things aligning at once and off I went into football and, and we found out about this, uh, this team, an all girls team. Um, and it was Stockport County as it turns out. And I went along to the first training session and it was just unbelievable because it was all these little girls who were just like me and they all had like shin pads and they were talking about the latest predator football boots and who the favorite players were. And I was like, my God, here's my people. Uh, it was just an amazing feeling. And, um, and from there, I, I, you know, I stayed at Stockport County a few years and then I went into the Premier League playing for Tranmere. That was my first uh, Premier League team. Uh, then I ended up at Doncaster Bells, which was the team I always wanted to play for. And uh, I got the opportunity to play for England. Um, so that was how it started in this country. And then, of course, I went off to America and played in America for five years, uh, spent a pre-season in Brazil. And then I finished my career in Sweden. So I had some incredible experiences traveling all over the place and getting to live in different countries, which was uh, just amazing, really. Um, then how did you go from that journey? So uh, Tranmere, not so far from here on the Mersey, uh, Doncaster Bells, England under 18s, then what brought you back into boxing? No, no more doing a crane and karate kid. There's got to be another. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, well, again, it, 
again, it's like anything like you, you all have in your lives and careers. Things happen at, at certain times and you don't know why they're happening. And it doesn't seem like there's going to be anything positive to come from it at all. It's just a horrible place to be in. But quite often when you look back, you see without that, you wouldn't have been, you know, compelled or catapulted into the next really good thing that you did. And that's certainly been the case for me. Um, so one of the things that happened in terms of sport um, was that in my last year in America, I broke my leg. And I'd had lots of injuries before that anyway. Um, but it was my last year. It was, it, was, it was a big prestigious thing to get to be a senior on a scholarship over there. Um, and I don't know, we just had a fantastic start to the season. I'd scored four goals. We had a great team chemistry. It was just such a, a great feeling around the team. And then four games in, I broke my leg and I was absolutely devastated. And somehow I got back for the end of the season and we, uh, we got through to the Sweet 16 of the national championships. We flew to California for this big game. It was just like a dream come true, really. Um, and it, the game went to penalties. And uh, I, I took the third penalty. She saved it. They scored and they went through. And I think in that moment, I mean, there isn't much like sport that can give you that raw emotion. Very few things where in a, the exact same moment at the same time for the same reason, you know, one person or a group of people are absolutely devastated and it feels like your world's ended and everybody else is completely in a moment of euphoria. It's, you know, when we, can, we can't always predict it. We don't know what's going to happen. That's what makes it exciting. But it's horrible if you're on the, the bad end of it. And that honestly felt like my whole world just completely crumbled. Um, and I felt massively betrayed by the thing that I'd loved more than anything in my life, which was football, which is a bizarre thing to say, but it's true. I felt betrayed by the sport that I'd given so much of myself to. And I, I couldn't understand how football could have done that to me. And I just knew it would never be the same. And I did finish, obviously, playing in America. I, I went and played in Sweden because I'd already signed the contract. And I enjoyed it. You know, I loved it. But it was never quite the same. And so during that time, I started to think, maybe this now is the time to box because I'd never lost that hunger and desire to be a boxer. And by then, but women's boxing was legal. Um, and it had been legal for 10 years because it was, I was 17 when it, when, it, when it was made legal, thanks to Jane Couch and Sarah Leslie and Dinah Rose, obviously the QC and the solicitors who fought for it. Um, and so there was a national championship, there's talk of it coming in the Olympics. So I knew it was my time. So when I got back from, you know, pretty much my whole 20s, living abroad playing football, I met with my dad at a Cafe Rouge on Dean's Gate in Manchester. And um, he said, oh, all right, you know, you ready to settle down? I was like, what are you on about? He said, well, you're probably going to settle down now, aren't you? And I went, no, Dad. But you're talking. I said, well, I'm going to box now. And he didn't really say anything at all. And then um, he rang me a couple of days later and he said, um, right, if you want to box, then, you know, OK. I was like, oh, Dad, did you think I was asking you? <laughs> well, it's like me, don't ask the dad stuff. I was telling you, that's what's going to happen. And he was like, yeah, I thought that. And he said, right, well, I want to be a coach. I want to help you be the best you can. And we just went on to have this amazing, amazing journey together in boxing throughout my amateur career. Did you have any doubts? You know, you've just, you know, you've been away. Like, you know, you think of people your age and you're, you know, you've played for Stockport, you've played um, for Doncaster Bells, Tranmere, you've then gone over to the States. You know, you've now, for some people could, could have just gone, right, that's it, right, I've done it. I've had my big journey, you know. Um, not necessarily about the settling down, but right, yeah, I'm going to go in, I'm going to go and work in an office. <laughs> Yeah. I'm laughing inside when I'm saying out loud because I know you, but you know, but did you ever yeah. have No, and I think I had, the, 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 obviously I had some doubts that I was over, I was 29 before I had my first competitive boxing debut. Um, but I'd kept up with my boxing training throughout my football career. So in the off season, I was always in the boxing gym. Um, so I'd, it was not like I came to it because people say, oh, she went from football to boxing. I didn't. I would have done boxing if it had been legal for women. And that's a key <laughs> bit of information but they say it as if I just went oh, what should I do now I'll just box I always wanted to box I, I wasn't allowed it was illegal um so I'd never lost that hunger and desire anyway and I think with the the broken leg and knowing that you know I didn't feel the same about football that obviously was it was a big turning point also while I've been home for one of the summers that was in America I'd watched the women's um ABAs the national championships Northwest region rounds and I watched the, the you know the, the women boxing and I thought I, I'm as good as them I, I can do it but um 
I think a lot of people said sort of, oh, you're old, you're this, you're that. Well, I knew that. What well, I can't change my age. What, what, you know, what am I supposed to do? Wait another couple of years till I'm even older. Um, but I think whenever I got the doubts and whenever I got the, you know, that little voice in your head, which we all get, whatever we do, like that voice going, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you do? I, I always would think to when I was that little girl, standing with all my mates in the gym, dead excited, just like them, being told I couldn't do it and just being so gutted. And I thought, you know, any time that you feel nervous or you're doubting or you think, oh, I could do what, put myself through this, whatever those doubts or questions were, I'd remind myself that I'd have given anything when I was that little girl to have that opportunity. And I owed it to her and therefore all other little girls in a roundabout way to, to do it. Um, and that drove me, still does. So you building up to the fight of your life, you know, you go out to Zimbabwe, didn't you? It's like, did it take a day to get there? Yeah, so that was as a professional. So as, a, as an amateur, that was a bit with my dad, where he's my coach. And we got to go all over the world. And, you know, I, I got to box for England and I won a silver at the European Championships, which was a profound turning point for me. Um, one, because I, it, you know, sort of confirmed to me that I was at that level. I was, you know, world class. It was also surreal standing on the podium watching my country's flag be raised with a medal around my neck having been banned from the sport as a kid it was like wow is this actually happening um, and also it's the very very first time in my career that I felt worthy that I felt deserving of that moment and that achievement and I'd never ever had that before um, and that was a massive turning point for me um, and then fast forward a couple of years um, I'd, I was getting ready to go back to the worlds and the Europeans um, they didn't have the Olympic opportunity for me because there's not equal weight categories for women in boxing. Same at the Commonwealth Games, same at the European Games. So it was devastating to win the European silver medal and then realise it wouldn't allow me to go to those prestigious tournaments that I dreamed about. And that was purely because of gender and that's not right. And they shouldn't have one of the rings standing for equality if they're not actually going to make things equal for everybody. But anyway, <laughs> not that I'm an order out. Um, so um, that was very unfair that those opportunities weren't there. So the Europeans and the Worlds were every two years for women or every year for men. Um, so I'd waited, obviously. All I'd done was train, train, train for, to go back to the Europeans because I wanted a gold this time. Um, and I wanted to get a medal at the Worlds. And then it was about three months before the Europeans, I got a routine sort of, you know, knee injury, a bit of a cartilage tear. The repair should have been about six weeks. Um, and they made a mistake in surgery and I woke up with a second degree, second degree chemical burn all over my leg, which was um, horrifically painful. It wasn't treated and, you know, it ended up getting infected. I was really, really ill. I had to go to the Burns unit and get it. It was just horrendous. So I was out for 12 months. So I missed the Europeans and the Worlds. And again, like I say, in that dark tunnel, you think, why on earth is this happening? Like, this, there's nothing good about this whatsoever. But I think what it did do is make me think, right, I don't want to wait another two years for the Europeans and Worlds. I can't go to the Olympics. I can't go to the Commonwealth Games. All the European Games. And that's what made me think about turning professional. And I thought, do you know what? It's unknown territory. I don't know what I'm getting into. There's very few other women doing it, but somebody's got a, you know, some of us have to be the first, so why not me? And that catapulted me to, you know, turn professional. And um, I made my debut in Manchester, which was an amazing emotional occasion and just a fantastic night. Uh, and then, you know, uh, just over 18 months later, I found myself in Zimbabwe fighting for the Commonwealth title. And I remember watching you, because you put it on Facebook Live, didn't you? And I remember watching that, I think it was a Friday night or something. You traveled for something like 20 hours or something to get there. It was in ticked, it was, yeah. Oh my God, I just remember that. Because it wasn't long after I'd first met you, but obviously you stays once you met, you know, there for life kind of thing. And I remember <laughs> just, what, I just felt there was a real sense of wanting to watch. I felt that like you just wanted to be with you kind of thing. And you, and you actually, you headlined, um, um, the, the night didn't you headline the fight? It, you know, um, so what? What was it like? It was unbelievable. I mean, it <clears throat> it was um, it was we only had about eight weeks' notice because we, we had known that this was a possibility, but you can't ever think anything in boxing. It's such a weird business that you just never know what's what's going to actually come off and happen. But it had been talked about for some time, and um, about. It, it was in, um, it was July the 13th, the actual fight, Friday the 13th of, of July. And uh, a, a few weeks before, in the, at the start of June or whatever it was, we were meant to box at the Middleton Arena. 
And about 10 minutes before I was going to go out, there was a stabbing in the lobby, which was awful. And they called the whole thing off. So again, I was like dead miserable that weekend. And I was like, oh, nothing's working out. Nothing's going right. And then we got the call on the Monday. Um, and they were like, and, and I get more sugar and rubbish in that weekend than I've ever done in my life because I'd obviously ate really, really clean for this fight. And then it got called off on the Friday and I was like, right, that's it. And I just ate, you know, marshmallows for breakfast. That It was gross. So I was actually feeling really ill on the Monday. I'd actually been sick. That's how ridiculous I'd been. And I was feeling all sorry for myself. And my manager rang and said, we've, we've got the, the call. Zimbabwe's on and I was like get rid of all the sweets get rid of all that chocolate like get back in the gym and that was it we had eight weeks to prepare and we left no stone unturned I mean we went to the the Institute of Performance in Manchester and we went in the climate chamber training at altitude and, and extreme heats and all sorts which was brutal but it got me ready and then um, when I got there it was incredible because no British person of, of any gender had boxed in uh, Zimbabwe for 36 years and it was also the first uh, female combat fight to be shown across all of their free, uh, you know, sports channels across the continent. So it was over, there was millions and millions of people watched it then. It was a massive build up. I was extremely nervous. I mean, that week we visited lots of schools and we went to visit some children's homes. And um, when we were in the van, they had the, low, the you know the radio on. Um, in Zimbabwe and uh, they had an interview with my opponent who was going like you know I'm going to knock her out and I was like oh this is just what I need and I'm trying to do you know what I mean? <laughs> pull out on the bus so well that was that and um, on the night it was just incredible like what um, what an amazing experience it was it was a fantastic you know Zimbabwe is an amazing place the people were incredible um, I just loved it I absolutely loved it and um, obviously that the, the, the feeling I, I'm of, of being announced as the, the Commonwealth title winner and being the first British woman to do it is, is impossible really to put into words. It, it, it felt like I hadn't let everyone down because I was worried about letting everyone down and it, it, I knew it would, you know, inspire others and it just justified everything I'd been through in a way. And that's the beauty of sport that it's, it is that way or that way. And it's a fine line, but when you're on the right side of it, it it's just, it does make everything you've been through just feel worth it. And I, you know, I don't know if everybody always gets that in other lines of work. Uh, some maybe, but that one defining moment where it's just, you know, it feels like you're floating and you're top of the world. You do get in sport and it's, it's quite special and that's how it felt. Um, which was followed by a downer, obviously, straight after it. But, um, you know, we've solved that it's now. Hard, wasn't it? You've got the highest of the high. You've, you know, you've had this whole amazing journey. The injuries, the, the different paths you've taken. Um, and you must, as I must have been a buzz, like being going to visit all the schools, especially when you're so passionate about yeah. your talent and paving the way. And it must have been amazing for them to see you and, and whatever. And then you win the title, right? And then you get given the. Yeah, I think I didn't get a belt. So that was the downer after it. I mean, it was a massive high. And then to not get the belt was just, um, I mean, just sickening, disappointing heartbreaking, I don't know what, what other words to use because that's the whole point of it is is getting that belt or that trophy or that medal or whatever you've done it for. So to not have it and not have that, you know, that, that in your hands, what you fought for was horrible. Um, and so when I got back from Zimbabwe, I, I spoke to the head of the Commonwealth Boxing Council and said, you know, it was an amazing experience, you know, I've loved it, but not getting a belt was not quite the fairy tale I'd had in mind. Um, and he said, oh, I can explain what's happened. Um, he said, the manufacturers of the replica belt have ceased production. And I said, what's that got to do with me? And he said, well, we do replica belts for women and real belts for men. So I said, my God, I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, there's more money in men's boxing. Well, I said, I know, but surely, <laughs> even if it meant paying for it with my own money, I should have had the option to have that belt because I'm never going to get that moment back. And I had thought that the worst moment would be straight after in the ring, you know, me and my coach not having that moment to have that belt. And we've got no photos of that moment. Um, with, with the belt, which every fighter has, you know, after they've won a championship, they, they have that moment with the belt or whatever it is. And I said, uh, but I said to him, do you know, it, that wasn't the worst moment. The worst moment was when I came home because everyone was so excited to see this belt. But I hadn't had the heart to tell them there wasn't one because I didn't want to put a, a downer on things. But then we got back to Manchester Airport and all my coaches and mine, friends and families were there. And not having that belt to share with them was horrible. One, because I wanted to share that moment with them and they deserved it too. But two, 
that made me feel like a second class citizen that everybody knew the only reason that I didn't have that belt is because I'm female, despite doing everything that a male would have had to do more actually to win that title. You know, I'd made history. I'd gone all the way to Zimbabwe, well out of my comfort zone, taking a risk, won the, won the belt and then didn't have it. And I got to the airport and it's just like, well, you're not as good as sick of it. I'm sick of that happening in society over and over again. And that was a blatant example of it. So I explained this to him and said, right, you know, what's done is done. How quickly can I have a real belt? Um, to which he said, um, we can have one uh, within the next couple of weeks, uh, but they're quite expensive. So unless you've got a sugar daddy, you probably won't be able to have one, which again, extremely difficult to put into the words that, that burning sense of injustice in me, that extremely patronising. I was working full time in a school at the time and I've worked throughout my sports career always. I've had to and I'm proud to have done so. So it's that much more patronising and as I always say, I did want to be like Liam Neeson and be like, I will find you, I will kill you. But <laughs> I know then it's easier than say, look, they're really they're de hysterical, they don't control their emotions. So we kept the dialogue open. I said, look, this can't happen to another future female champion. Um, we've got to come up with something else. And that's when they decided to make the, uh, the women's uh, Commonwealth title belt. We got it in the December, so I fought in the July. Um, it, they found a manufacturer and made the belt and sent it to us by December. And now it's available for all. Uh, future female champions and uh, this is it this is the first ever one so it has all these colors because these are all the colors of the uh, Zimbabwe country's flags so it's there now and that's part of what paving the way is as all of you are doing in your fields we're paving the way for those who've come after us just as those who've come before us have let, allowed us to do what we do and it's important because I know you're so passionate about this and you just so paved the way project is now it's now a charity uh, yeah, yeah. Ten weeks ago, we got charity status, so not been able to do much with it because we're uh, <laughs> obviously there's loads of other stuff going on. But uh, yeah, we've we've got it, and uh, so that's a big milestone for us. So, so tell us about it, and how can people get involved? Because I know it's you know it's great because you are the absolute symbol, and you live and breathe what you've created and paved the way. Uh, but so many people are doing so many different things that could get involved, right? So tell us how can people get involved? Yeah, so it started out as. Um, just a one week project during Women's Sport Week, which coincided with my pro debut. Women's Sport Week was a thing they used to do, where for one week, um, all of the media outlets used to cover women's sport, like their lives depended on it, and then just ignore us for the other 51 weeks of the year. Um, we don't have it anymore, because we do tend to get you know a lot better coverage now, which is a good thing. Um, so it, I, I'd always done other people's projects for Women's Sport Week, and I just wanted to do my own. So we set it up and, and when I started boxing, usually you get a boxing nickname, like the assassin or whatever. My nickname amongst my friends is SpongeBob SquarePants. Um, this is because whenever I get injured and put on weight, I turn into a square shaped human. Um, so my friends are all horrible and call me SpongeBob. Um, and it's not a very good name for a boxer. Um, so I knew I couldn't go with that. So instead I decided to go for something that I stand for and believe in, which is paving the way. So the project was just for a week, visited loads of schools, community groups, did some sessions, sports sessions. We had um, a photography exhibition of women who work in sport, because I feel that they're just massively invisible. Um, and that's on permanent display at the Velodrome now in Manchester. And that was it really. I thought, right, you know, done, that was great. But then people started to use the hashtag and they started to, and I thought, there's something here, maybe I need to do more with it. So it's just carried on from there, really. And it's changed in, in two key ways, um, you know, since it started. And obviously now that we're a charity, one is that it, it, it's now about other industries because through going to lots of businesses and speaking to, you know, lots of other women, it's become quite clear to me that my experience as a woman in sport is <laughs> very similar to that of women in law, in tech, in construction, in sales. You can go on and on and on. Um, and really what's more powerful, I mean, I believe sport's one of the most powerful things on the planet for bringing about positive change. And when sport and business comes together, it's phenomenal what can happen. Um, so I thought this can't just be about sport. It needs to be about other things because it, it can impact other areas of life sport. It can impact workplace, home life, other aspects of society is that powerful. And then the other way is that it's about both genders because Yes, men face far less stigma in sport. In fact, it's really, really hard to think of sports where men are kind of not meant to be there or it's, you know, it, 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 there's maybe two or three, um, whereas women, there's lots. However, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have had a lot of 
you know, parents contact me and say their son loves ballet or loves this, loves that, and they're giving up or they don't want to do it because they're getting picked on. You know, we're underrepresented for males in nursing, in primary school teaching, social work, social care, and men can be great at nurturing and caring for others, just as some women can. So I think there's work to do in that way as well. And I just don't feel that it's a zero sum game. If things are better, you know, for one group of people, it's better for everybody. I don't see how, we, you know, we, we, we all have to lose out just because things are better for each other. So uh, that, those are the ways that it's changed. And uh, so we're literally right at the beginning again now of, of how to, you know, how to uh, make a difference and make a change and, um, and what's the best way to go about it. So we've got three trustees. Um, I think that was four. <laughs> three trustees. I can't count. Uh, I won't be doing the accounts, obviously. Um, three trustees and me. Uh, and that's, you know, that's all we've got at the minute. Um, we've got, obviously, because the, the lockdown's happened, we've not been able to do much. Um, but we've, you know, we've got our business plan together. We've got strategies, we've got ideas of how we think we can bring about change. And that we're right at the early stages, to be honest, Simone. So um, it's, been, it's been tough because, like, for nine months, I've been trying to get this charity status and I didn't have a clue how to fill all that paperwork out. And I had to keep looking up in the dictionary what words meant you know I didn't know what a lot of these things meant like dividends and this and that and I was like what the hell's that I've never had to you know do it in the jobs that I've done or in sport but um but yeah it's you know it, it shows that I guess if you get the right people around you and, and get the right advice you, you can do it and um I think through Northern Power Women we've seen that you know you can have that focus on making things better for women but what I really love is that you always embrace those Northern Power men as well. And, um, you know, you and I are lucky to have them in our lives, you know, Rob and Tim. Um, I mean, they don't have a choice, but they are very supportive anyway. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, the, the wider a field, we know there's so many amazing uh, male role models who support this and they know it's important and why it's important. And it's really important to include that, I think. I think it's really, I think that whole advocacy all around is, is absolutely critical. And I always think that Northern Power Women is a little bit mischievous, you know, because I remember in the early days, it was, what about the Northern Power Men? And you were like, well, you know what? We've always been, it's all genders, all backgrounds, all stories, because everyone, like you say, it's not the sum of all the parts. Like, it's not like pie, is it? That if you get a bit more over here, then you lose out here. Let's just talk about women's sport, because, it, you know, I wanted, when I was growing up, and I am obviously older than you, uh, I wanted to play for Everton ladies, but there was no such thing. There was, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I should have had me on your radio show, but it was, um, but there was no such thing. There was no women's football. There was no women's kit. Um, and it was almost one of those. There was, there was nowhere to even, it wasn't even on the horizon. And now you look at it, you look at, you know, sort of the Lionesses last season, you look at the start of the Women's Super League this season where you brought your, your lovely Ruby, didn't you, you know, to, to that game. 30,000 people in a stadium watching football. Oh yeah, women will happen to be playing. You know, you look at the netball, you look at the cricket, you look at the rugby, um, uh, the rugby as well absolutely blazing the trail so why why is the women's super league season not has been sort of ended you know so they're going to play out the the premier league but do you feel does is that frustrating the fact that the women's super league has has been ended has not been allowed to complete because of the pandemic it boils my blood in every single vein running through my body simone it, and, and i mean that sincerely uh, a lot of it's down to money which is why i don't follow the premier league anymore because it's become far too much about money for me and it's lost the heart and soul of what sport always has been to me um, and I think when we when we look at social change <coughs> there tends to be a pattern so ridicule you know when someone's doing something for the first time uh, then discussion and then acceptance and there can be a thousand years <laughs> between each stage and there can be different people at different stages when we look at women's sport different parts of women's sports at different stages. If we take football as an example, when I was playing, it was all ridicule. There wasn't a really a much of it. There was pockets, but very little. Generally speaking, the majority was ridicule. Um, and when I got my first England call up and I got that letter, the email them now, obviously, but you used to get a letter. Uh, I was 16 and I got that letter with the three lines on and it just is the most incredible feeling as a kid to get that call up. And I worked in a factory at the time and, and I went to my boss and I said, I need a week off, but there's nothing on the rotor. Oh, what do you need a week off for? So I said, well, um, you know, I've, I've 
I've, I've got this letter and I kind of gave it him and I stood there and I was dead excited and dead proud and he didn't really say anything and he read it over and, he saw, and then he said, so you want me to give you a week off to play for a women's football team? I said, well, it is the England women's football team. And he said, Pfft. and he made all these jokes and innuendos. And I said, can I just take it unpaid? It really means a lot to me. And he went, well, if you must. I walked out of that office, Simone, feeling really small. I felt like an idiot for thinking it was a big deal to play for England. I felt ashamed, really, of, of thinking it was such a big I didn't tell any of my colleagues that was going or anyone else. Um, now, I know we can't change every individual. And there are many women like that as well. Let's not pretend all women are behind this because they're not. It's not a man and woman thing. People, we can't always change people like that who have those views. I see my job and our job to make sure that any person, particularly young people, who come out of an interaction like that, whether it's about race, disability, sexuality, class background, whatever, or gender, that the, they can still feel proud of who they are and what they're doing, despite those negative attitudes of others. Um, and that's what I see my job as, because that profoundly impacted me. And I know that when I stood on that lineup for the anthem, I thought, this isn't what I thought it'd be. It didn't feel as good because we had the England football team and the women's England football team. And see, that's a problem when we're presenting on sport. We need to say men's cricket, women's cricket, men's... Look at the Olympics. I've always known it's men's and women's in all the categories. We never, ever hear a commentator say at the Olympics, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're excited now that we've got the women's javelin coming up and then we'll have the javelin. What? You'd be like, what, what are you on about? It must mean men's javelin. But that's what we do with sport. So it's, we're always the other. They're not as good as the other bit. We have to put women in front of it to make sure they know it's those ones. And when I was on that lineup, that's how I felt. Like I was not in the proper England football team. It was just the women's. And I didn't know that as a 16-year-old. You know, I was aware of the attitudes about women's sport. But I wasn't aware of why they were there. What was the truth behind it? How we'd been held back for years? Why we were viewed in that way? So all I did was internalise it and feel crap about myself, crap about my achievements, and that's no longer the case. Now I'm the total opposite, where I understand why we're years behind and how we've been denied opportunities despite the talent being there. And that's why I'm really passionate about changing it because I'm aware now and I don't internalise it. And it still does hurt. Last week, you know, I saw the BBC Sport two weeks ago put out a thing saying um, uh, discussions are underway about what to do about the women's season. Simone, the comments on there, my God. And they were like... Um, why don't they have an iron off? Why don't they have a bake off? I'm glad the women's season has been cancelled because I'm hungry now and I need a sandwich. It went on and on and on. And you know, I, I know people think this is far fetched, but when you look at the massively increased rates in domestic violence since lockdown, three women in the Northwest in the last two weeks have been found with the bodies dumped in a local park from their current or former spouse. Now, if we're going to accept just mocking women, and making them not as good as them, constantly allowing us to put them down, even from childhood where we use girls and insults still, you know, where adults will say to young boys, you're a girl, you're, and use that as an insult. All of it counts. And we have to do something about the way that we socially accept on a regular basis to put women down. And women internalise that. You know, women will say it about one another, about ourselves. It's not good enough. We need to do something to change it. So I'm really very angry that we have not taken the opportunity to maximise the exposure of women's sport while there's no bloody sport going on. Like, why was it not on the telly immediately? Reruns of stuff that's been played. 52% of taxpayers, uh, sorry, licence payers for the BBC are women. 52%. We should be resent represented in that manner, surely. So... Yeah, I'm really, really angry. Look what you've done. <laughs> you've done now. <laughs> I'm really angry because this was a great opportunity. And out of crisis, good things can come. And this was our opportunity to really, you know, champion and highlight and support our women's sport. It's cheap. It's massively cheaper than men's sports because there isn't that massive. So what's the excuse? We, we should be doing better. And I'm really, really annoyed that... You know, we've, we've, we've seen in Germany, the women's league's back on and they've put it on loads of channels. They've, it's been happening in America that, and we haven't done it. Why have we not done it? It's very, very infuriating. And what is the line coming out? What's the line coming out? Is it, it's all that money, which is... Well, it seems that way. And a, a large part of it with, with just the Premier League. I mean, I know horse racing's come back. I don't know anything at all about horse racing. I don't know that much about cricket and Formula One, but I know they've come back. In, in terms of football... 
I know that because obviously I do a radio show for the BBC and I know that even for that local radio show, what they have to pay to have a seat in the press box at places I call Trafford is extortion every season. So part of the thing is that a lot of these football clubs have been paid a massive amount of money from these TV companies for a contract to do X amount of games. If they don't get those games, they get a rebate. So none of these football clubs want to be paying back all these millions to Sky, BT and all the other gazillion things you have to have just to watch a game of football these days. Um, they don't want to be doing that. So it's much better, even if it's behind closed doors, people think, oh, they're not going to get that revenue. Yeah, but they're not going to lose 300 million quid or whatever it is through those. But that's not the only reason to do things. Do you know what I mean? That, this is where, and this is why I'm inspired by a lot of businesses that I go to because, you know, I had a, I had a downer on business for years because I always thought, oh, you know, when I was first asked to speak in business, I was like, no, they're not my people. They're all driven by profit. They're all horrible. And I was totally wrong because I've been to so many businesses now where they really genuinely care about stakeholders, about their employees, about the community, how they can use our platform for society. And it's really inspired me. And I know that's possible when businesses do that, great things happen. Why are we not doing that in, in sport and in sports marketing, in media, why are we not realizing that actually it's good for society if we make things more equal for people and better for people? So why does it always have to come down to money? It ought not to, and it annoys me. But this is now, I think there is still an opportunity. I hear what you're saying about, you know, I was absolutely fuming last week with the Women's Super, you know, when the Women's Super League announcement was, was made because it just didn't make sense. No. And the fact that, you know, that Man City are fuming, obviously, because they've given the, they've done it back on points and who's got the, the average or whatever. And, it, and Chelsea have been uh, awarded and you're just like, oh, for goodness sake, it just doesn't seem, it's, it's like a maths competition, isn't it, that, is, that has won. Uh, it's in still sports day. Oh, yeah. just, oh, really, all they're here for is to take parts. As long as all the little ones get a medal on the way home, it's all right. Well, no, actually, it's it's our lives. And I think we've got the spotlight. I think sport is, I've always been so passionate about sport and I've always been really concerned about the disconnect. So the earlier the age that you opt out of sport, so as predominantly young women and young girls will opt out of sport, they kind of learn to... They, they learn to not take the knocks, learn not to lose. And maybe just going back to me being an Evertonian again, Stace, I don't know, you know, but you know. You just learn to lose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was a patch in the 80s. Um, <laughs> but you, know, you learn you play nice, to win together, to lose together, to celebrate yeah. together, to, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I think there was, it's so important. It's, you know, it's so important to be part of, um, you know, sort of how we how we build our future generations. But I do, I'm absolutely passionate about um, taking this opportunity now. You know, yeah. we, we're not going to come out and go back to normal. We have an opportunity to rewrite, yes. and reframe, and we have to take it. So if we yeah. don't take it, then do you know what? What's going to happen? We're going to go back and it'll be a bit like coming back off your holidays and going oh god that's in ages ago and, and all of a sudden it's all forgotten and we're through it and we're into you know the same vibe and all of a sudden all these opportunities have gone so we have to take the opportunities yeah. what any what what would you say are top tips that we could do you know use your voice you are using your voice what else can we do do you mean in terms of women's sport I think there's I think there's two sides I think there's absolutely how we use our voice I think you talk about pave the way and what we can do to encourage we, you've got the, the, our, our, the kids now they've got a long period now with schools not going back till september right yeah so you know and there is in you know if we're sensible you can be outside what what can we be doing what is that so what's the business of what can we be doing around using our voice to influence the new future and what's our what's our creative social distance in sport see i would love rounders stace i think bring back rounders you know, you're socially distanced-ish. I think, I mean, in terms of getting out and, do, and doing sport, I, I think th this is where, you know, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, often we're focusing on four groups, aren't we? Gender, sexuality, race and disability, and rightly so, because there's a lot of work to do for, for all of those groups, of which, you know, some of us will be part of one of those groups, maybe we'll come under two of those groups. It, it's different for everybody's intersectionality. Um, but I also think class is an absolutely massive area of inclusion that, that goes really untalked about in England. And I think we've seen that with sport, that what we've seen, uh, and it's been good, it's all been inspiring. What we've seen from a lot of the major governing bodies is all these lovely videos of families out on bikes together and 
you know, building their own entire fitness equipment, mini gym in the yard and all that. And that's fantastic. It really, really is. But what we haven't talked about is, you know, single parents who are stuck in with two kids in an high rise flat. And I can't help but think about those because obviously I still work one day a week in a school um, with kids who are, you know, massively impacted by this through poverty and that they're already living in places that are really not suitable and appropriate for families to be in anyway. And these landlords get away with it time and time again. Um, and then suddenly there's lockdown where you've got a couple of teenagers, you haven't got the money to buy bikes, you haven't got the space outside to have a garden or play. Do you know, and this, I think this, you know, I, I hoped this would highlight the disparities more in terms of how, you know, that, and we've all been talking about being in the same boat for this corona. We're not. We're in the same storm, but we're in very different boats. And I was hoping that we would do more to say, why are we all in, why are some people in an absolutely massive ship. We understand they've done well, they've done this, whatever. But why does that have to mean that someone's in an absolutely shit dinghy mm -hmm. hanging on for dear life? Because do you know what? That's not just when Corona's on, that is all of the time. And what we've seen is that I see this, this happen all the time working in a school and working in communities and the charities that I'm an ambassador for. People have their own mini Corona all the time. So they might get really ill and suddenly they've got, there's no furlough for them. There's no support network. They're done. And they, you know what I mean? It, these kind of things happen a lot. They might have a child who's poorly. So, you know, Tim, my, my partner, he lost his little girl a few years ago. He got 300 pound and two days off when he lost a child. That was the support that he got as a parent of a, you know what I mean? A grieving parent. That's the society we live in. So, you know, sport's important. Using our voice is important, but we need a massive change of how we look after people and treat people in our society so quite how we do that i don't know but i know it starts with us recognizing it acknowledging it and caring and saying my god we need to do better um so i think there's loads of ways we can do it and these kind of things are so so important for it because i think of every single person on here and you simone obviously as well but every single person on here i know not everyone's got the video on but every name every face on here is a positive petrol tank for me that we are in a, an uphill fight all of the time trying to make things better, whether that's for women, for, you know, ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, whatever it is, we, we, we try and we're all dedicated and trying to make things better collectively. And that gets you down because you can feel like you're going uphill all the time. And hi, Sally. And um, what happens is when you're feeling down and you're like, oh, is there, are we getting in there? Is there any point? All of you are a positive petrol tank for, for each other. And certainly for me, where I feel like that, Fuel's going down like last week and I was reading one comment after another. Why don't they have an iron off? Why don't they have a bake off? Women's sports shit anyway. They shouldn't be allowed to do it. Da, da, da. And bit by bit, my petrol tank was going down and down. And I was like, who oh, oh, was getting more and more. And then when I go on to things like the Northern Power Women's site and lots of other, you know, avenues of women's sports, trust and loads of other things, women in law that I was speaking to the week. And you think, do you know what? No. And it fills up your tank again and you can go again. So, I don't know what, what exactly what the answers are. I just think sticking together, using each other's positive petrol source, and, and, and d d we cannot get too tired to keep fighting this. We've got to. We've got to do everything that we can and inspire others around us because we know, yes, there's a long way to go, and we talk about that a lot, but look where we've come from. Look what we're able to achieve and the things that people, women who've come before us have been up against. It, and just a tiny example from sport, which you've heard before, Simone, is that we weren't allowed to run more than 200 meters at one time and we were banned from the marathon. And there were three main reasons why they banned us from the marathon. One, we'd get big legs, so horrendous. Two, we'd get a hairy chest, which I quite like, joking. And number three, that our uterus would fall out. How ridiculous. And that's why we paved the way and I'd encourage you to do the same. For every type of oppression, whether that's you know gender, race, whatever it is, question it, challenge it and change it. Quite often we don't question the way things are and it stays the same. How ridiculous that for all of those years, nobody questioned this theory of our uterus falling out. Nobody thought to say, well, actually we give birth and children come out like actual real life babies come out of there and no other stuff falls out. So probably we can run without organs falling all over the track. And it was only until someone questioned that and then they said, yeah, and then it changed. So we must question, challenge and change the way that, that, that we view things. And I think it starts 
with that. And so if you look at where we've come from and now, 12,000 women last year ran the Boston Marathon. Jasmine Paris from just up the road, another northerner, uh, won the Montaigne Spine Race. Uh, you know, 268 miles in 83 hours whilst breast pumping milk for the baby that she'd just given birth to six months ago. Women are pretty phenomenal, but we have to realise that and we have to make sure we tell everyone else that as well and never stop shouting it. You've got to take your platform, haven't you? And I've got, um, I've got a question here. We've got Hazel from the University of Liverpool. Hi there. Um, thanks both. Um, thanks, Stacey. I love that you're getting so angry about some of these issues that you're talking about. And I think, I think we're all in agreement with you. Um, I think it's, it's nice to see, especially that a lot of young girls these days are coming through and playing more sport. But my question is, how do we encourage more young women into the business of sport? Yeah, that's really important. And that's precisely why, thank you, Hazel. That's precisely why uh, we did our first photography exhibition on women who work in sport. Because I think athletes are much more visible now, thankfully. Not enough, but they are getting more visible. Um, and women who work in sport are almost invisible. It's very difficult to name prominent women who work in sport. Um, yet they are there and they're doing incredible things and they're amazing at what they do. Um, so I think, you know, I don't agree entirely with it. If you can see it, you can be it because someone has to be first to do, to do stuff. But generally speaking, we know what it means. Uh, and therefore, I think it is really important. So I think we need to be thinking about it from school age. If you've got young girls who are interested in sport, they don't have to be the best or the most talented or the most competitive. But if they've got that passion for sport, what else are they good at that could lend itself to a career in sport? Because pretty much anything you can, you know, whether it's, God, marketing, technology, accounting, PR, whatever, can, you can get a career in sport with those other, other skills that you've got. And I think we need to do a much better job of making girls know that, that, you know, you might not be in a sport where you can earn a living from it, or you might not be good enough or competitive nature to want to do that. But for your, through your interest or passion for sport, you can have this entire career. And I think we need to do loads better at letting you know, young women know that these are all the opportunities are out there for them in sport. Because without knowing, I mean, even for me, I mean, I, I've lived in sport, it's been my whole life. And through researching for that Women in Sport project, there was all sorts of jobs I never knew existed that was like, oh, that sounds cool. That I might have actually wanted to do when I was at school. And I don't know what all your work experience was like at school. I mean, they don't even really have it now, which is horrible. It's real, real shame. Um, but when I was at school and I, I said I was interested in sport, they offered me a placement at JJB. And I said, it's a shop. And they were like, it's a sports shop. And I went, I know, I don't want to bloody sell sports clothes. I want to like work in sport. If I, that's retail. I might as well be selling pots and pans or bloody lawnmowers. It's retail. I'm not interested in that. I want to do a job. They didn't have anything, anything at all. And, you know, I know it is much better now, but I think we can do much, much more to you know, highlight the women that have, uh, have got these jobs in sport and women in football do a good job of that. You know, they're a great organisation that do a lot of that and the Women's Sports Trust and, and beyond. There are a lot of them doing it, but we can. I think we need to do loads, loads better, to be honest, that, um, having those role models visible so that other girls know what's possible for them. Well, it's, it's more of a statement here from Pam. Thanks, Hazel. Um, but Pam has said, so pleased to hear about gender equality. As a mum of two boys, I've already seen one of mine give up on netball, age 10, as there's no boys team. So this is like what you were talking about, it's the reverse. This, but this comes under your pave the way, doesn't it? The PE curriculum is one of the things that I really desperately want to change. And that's because, I've, I mean, the whole thing, actually, across all subjects, because it's, I mean, I work in a school, I know. And if you've been homeschooled and you'll know, a lot of it's not anything to do with anything. But anyway, um, in PE, it's still very, very genderized. So for boys, we still have cricket, football, rugby, which we've had since the dawn of time. With girls, we still have netball, rounder, you know, why are we not making it? You know, when we look at the, the women's rugby team, they've won the World Cup twice. Our England women's uh, football team, they've got to the semi-finals of the World Cup twice. They've got to a European Cup final. We've got a professional league in this country. Cricket, our women's cricket team won the Ashes twice. Why are we not offering these sports to girls? And likewise with boys, you know, in our school, they don't get to opt for trampolining. Why? Why don't they get to do trampolining? And yeah, at first, like the first generation that we started to do boys trampolining, girls rugby and vice versa, it might be a bit like, well, that's fine. That, you have to go through that when you, 
when, when social change is happening. But eventually, the next generations that come through wouldn't know any different. And, the, you know, when we sometimes we would like to think that everybody would just do things for the right reasons, but they don't. So sometimes laws and policy has to come first which then that paves the way, if you like, for social change. And we've seen that we see this with physical things. So smoking on airplanes used to be a thing. How ridiculous we look back now and we go, my God, how could we have ever thought it was a good idea to have all them toxins in an aluminium tube, but we didn't know any different. Then scientists said, that's going to kill you. People still were like, oh, I'm not, not smoking for eight hours. Forget that, I'm getting me. So then they had to put laws in place and go, okay, well, if you do, you get arrested. Eventually, because of those laws, this generation just grow up knowing that you do things like put a seatbelt on, don't smoke on an aeroplane, you put your child in a proper car seat, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same with social change. So social change, social things are harmful, just like physical things. So gollywogs, for example, they used to be in Eni, I mean, I love Eni Blyton and, and, you know, she won't have known at the time, but gollywogs are in children's bedtime stories. Now we look back on that and we're horrified. That didn't just change for no reason. That changed because people, change doesn't just happen. People fought for it and said, this is not a positive representation of black people. So now this generation grow up, they don't know what a gollywog is, which is good because we've phased it out because we know it wasn't good for us. So all of these things happen because people make them happen. And it's exactly the same with things like the PE curriculum. We should put things in place. It's a policy in schools that all sports are offered to all children, regardless of gender. And at first, yeah, it might be a bit weird, just like it will have been weird for those very first drivers who were like, mm, don't like this seatbelt thing, you know, or people who had to strap the kid in a chair that was like you needed a degree in engineering to put them in. But, it, you know, now we just know it's the right thing to do and it'll be the same. And we need to change these policies so that it can change socially. And, and I think it's, it's, it's the same unless we change it. And um, I think you, you put out with question, challenge, change. I think you look, there is the opportunity now. You look at the, the academic curriculums are going to change. The university curriculums are having to find a different way to educate. So maybe that's the place to start, the PE curriculum. Maybe that is, you know. People have been doing Joe Wicks every day for the last 12 weeks. You know, people have been more kids that do Joe Wicks. But it's a routine and it might not be... Yep but it's a change and I think this is the opportunity so you are inspiring so many people today um, um just as a who is it uh Carla is gonna Harangay Borough Women's Football Club so she's gonna use that phrase question challenge change in a girls team training tonight um how can people get involved in Pave the Way Stace we'll put it in the um, we haven't got our own website and stuff yet because we've only just set up so Obviously, if you just follow me on social media, then as soon as we've, like once this is all over and we can get activated, then um, obviously we'll have a website, we'll have our first strategies, if you like, in place. And, you know, if anyone's got a certain skill set that they feel they can bring to it or ideas or anything, really, uh, then absolutely message me and, and you know, I can um, get in touch with you when we're able to, to get together because I certainly wouldn't have been able to set this up without the help of Robert Nieri, who's a lawyer at Bradner's who specialises in charity law and he approached me, you know, over a year ago and said, what are you doing with Pave the Way? And I, I said, I really want to make it a charity, but I ain't got a clue what I'm doing. And he's helped me. So those little conversations here and there, he had a, a very specific skill set. Um, and I made the mistake of saying to him, I'm not very good at the boring stuff. And he went, so am I one of the boring people? And I was like, well, yeah. And at the end of it, when we got charity status, he said, see, the exciting people need the boring people to make them things happen. And I was like, yeah, fair enough. So, um, yeah, if you're boring, get in touch because you. <laughs> we all need you. No, I'm kidding. You know, any skill set, you know, any expertise in that, it'll be massively helpful. And if there's anyone that has got that specific around setting up charitable trusts, potentially an exec or an advisor and stuff is what you need, we will put all this in the follow-up email. Um, as ever, it's just like hanging out with the most amazing friends uh, and role model and just somebody who is, you, you don't just pave the way, you're just doing it every minute. We love your passion, we love your energy, we are with you. Uh, as I said, we'll put all the details in the follow-up email. Thank you so much for being not just you, especially you, Stacey. And thank you, Tim. Uh, you can now unload the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks so much. Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. This will be, we'll put this on our YouTube channel, YouTube channel later. But thanks everyone. Stay safe. I uh, love to Tim. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. See you, Rob. 
See you, Stace. Bye. Behave yourself. See everyone. Thank you very much. Amazing. Absolutely amazing.